Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Drina Finds Out. This is the last episode before the election. Uh, we have took all these weeks to talk about the upcoming election and try to interview as many candidates that would speak with us to get ready. Uh, we've been building up to this, and today I have Mr. Jai Keaton. How you doing? What's happening? Man? I'm good, man. I'm, I'm excited about this election. So I, I saw your video, um, my friend, my co-host, the host of Sunday Street, Vario, he showed me a video about Vote for the Culture. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you know, so I mean, about myself, um, Jai Keaton, I'm from Mars Point, Mississippi. Um, I got involved in politics. I got involved in politics through business, to be honest with you. Like, the more I engage in business, the more money I begin to make. Um, the, the, the bigger my circles became, or the more influential my circles became, the more I realized how much politics controls economics. So I couldn't help but engage in politics and try to influence certain elections with candidates who would favor my needs. So um, so I actually ran for mayor in 2017 in Mars Point. And um, after that, I uh, worked with a chief of staff. I worked for a state representative um, where I was his chief of staff. Uh, that gave me, um, that gave me some experience um, on the state level playing politics, and um, I got involved in an organization called Mississippi Black Leadership Institute. That's MBLI. I got involved with an organization called the Next Gen Leadership Program with the National NAACP. So I was getting different. Um, um, perspectives, if you will, on the political spectrum. And um, that's kind of what made me feel like if we ain't talking about politics and economics, then we're not talking about power. So vote for the culture is just something that, you know, was placed on my spirit to just kind of encourage people between the age of, you know, 21 and 45, for the lack of better words, to engage in the power structure. And, um, and I know that our generation has lost faith in the political process, but if you look at it from the perspective of it being an experiment, if you don't believe in it, then you gotta try it. And, um, and, and voting for the culture really is based on, you know, the hip hop culture coming into politics and understanding that the more collective energy we give, the more collective power we put into the political process, the the greater our return on investment will be. Um, and we got to understand that it's not a short turnaround. It's not a quick thing. It's a 15, 20, 24 year thing before you can really expect to drive outcomes. And I think it's important for us to learn the playbook and how to play the game. So it's not just going to vote at the polls, it's identifying and grooming our own candidates, it's putting money up to get those candidates elected, and then it's having issues or having positions or policies that benefit us to hold those candidates accountable to drive outcomes that benefit our culture. Um, so that's kind of the whole premises behind Vote for the Culture. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people, um, not just people our age, but a lot of people that I know feel, don't think that local politics are that important, but I think that they're the most important. They make the biggest impact in our day-to-day -day life, more more so than even like the presidential election. Absolutely. I mean, we learned in 2016 um, that the Electoral College definitely plays a huge role in choosing who the president is. It's no secret that Hillary Clinton got 4 million or more votes than Donald Trump in 2016. But Trump won in the states that turned out the more electoral votes. And it's not a rigged system. It's pretty much like, and a lot of people don't say this enough to me, that the state votes, the majority of the state votes go towards that electoral college. So it's not like it's rigged. But if you got a state that's a democratic state, then those electoral votes will go towards the democratic candidate um, and vice versa. If you got a state that, you know, goes conservative or Republican, those electoral votes will go towards that Republican candidate. So it's important for us to understand the game and how it's played so we won't get frustrated when we don't get the outcomes that we desire. Um, I saw, because I was reading up on you, 
um, getting prepared for this, and I saw that you were talking about recreating the cool. Um, and to me, it, it seems like uh, pushing um, or getting the energy put back in those small neighborhoods, African American neighborhoods, um, and coming back together to push it, boost those up to where they need to be. Absolutely. I mean, you know, to your point, I mean, our politics is local. We start at the local level, and when we you know, in in, in, a, in this current state, we're questioning what to do. We're questioning whether we should believe in systems or not. And for me, Recreate the Cool really is based off of getting back to the things that worked for us pre-integration. So our generation and the culture don't talk enough about how successful African-Americans were before the 1970s. We, think, we don't think about the 1920s you got the Harlem Renaissance in the 1930s, when you had the great migration of African-Americans from the South up to the North, working in the mills and in the factories. And that's when you begin to see a growing middle class within African-Americans. By the time you get to 1940s, you got African-Americans that came home after World War II. So these people were not non-violent. They, they believed in protecting family. They understood you know, the Second Amendment rights and having guns and protecting family. And by the time you get to the 1950s, in the beginning of the civil rights era, um, you see them putting their money behind their political interest. By the time you get to the 1960s, you see the outcomes of that, meaning they started, you know, getting people elected, influencing policy. And then when you think about the neighborhoods, everybody likes to talk about, um, you know, Division Street in your case, if you're in Biloxi, go for it or, you know, the Magnolia alumni if you're in Moss, or, you know, Dab Street if you're in Hattiesburg, or Ferris Street, or Lynch Street if you're in Jackson, you know, U Street if you're in D.C. Right. You go across the whole spectrum and see that, you know, these African Americans had a growing, strong, bustling middle class that supported small businesses, supported, supported a progressive school districts, um, and supported them getting political power. Then something happened in the 70s. A lot of people don't talk about that part. You know what I'm saying? So to me, when I say recreate the cool, I'm just really saying, let's get back to those things that worked for our African-American communities before integration and make that cool again. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, another thing I saw is you um, are part of the, you're the deputy director for the planning and development. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, man. So, um, you know, there's layers, you know, it's le you know, levels, you know what I'm saying? So um, my professional background started in accounting. I got my degree in accounting from Jackson State University, Jackson State <laughs> University, you know what I'm saying? The I love. And then I went on to work um, in, in, in federal audit in DC after that. And then I quit corporate in 2012 to start my own business. And so, you know, I toured with the likes of Young Money and Street Execs with Two Chains and Grand Hustle with T.I. And, um, and then I came back to Mississippi in 2014 and, um, and I started engaging the community. Um, so that's how I got involved in politics because I was, I was able to have influence over my peers um, in Moss Point. And around that same time, I was trying to figure out how to improve my community. And because I was a, I'm a capitalist, because I'm a business guy, I was looking at um, you know, different ways of using or reusing, finding new uses, if you will, for the real estate that we had in Mars Point along the waterfront and throughout the community. And that's how I began to understand economic development and how economics controls or influences our community. And there's not enough African-Americans at the table to have a, a, a say over what businesses come into the community, what tax incentives your community has access to to stimulate investment. And so I went back to grad school in 2019 and got a master's in economic development and landed a job with the city of Jackson as the deputy director of planning and development where um, I control all economic development, real estate development and business development for the city of Jackson. So um, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool situation to be in. Yeah, definitely very impressive. Um, I've, I've been to all the places, well, not all the places you've named, but I've been to, anytime we would go on vacation as a child, whatever city we went to, we would try to find those neighborhoods where 
those thriving black businesses were at one point. And, you know, you still had a few that were still there. But of course, I think that is something that, I think people now are starting to make more of an effort to build those things back up to the way they used to be. And I'm excited about seeing what happens in the future. Um, even just, even just not selling the homes that are in those neighborhoods to the highest bidder, because you know whoever has passed on and you don't want to just do anything with the house anymore. I think those things play a big part of it as well. Um, so, are you excited about the election? I mean, you know, I'm excited about the energy that's going into the election. One of the biggest misconceptions um, about me from, you know, my content and what I choose to talk about on social media is that I'm really this political person that's deeply involved in politics and policy. And the reality is that's not true. Like, I don't really follow, I don't I don't believe the politicians. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I approach who I vote for and how I vote um, similar to that of a strategy with a craps game. Like, you know, you got red and black and you can either bet on point which is to me is betting on policy, betting on the point. That's very, very specific, you know, and there's so many candidates that got all of these policies. And the reality is, you know, you really can't keep up with or hold everybody accountable because there's so many different layers. You got Congress that influences policy. You got the president that has the ability to veto those policies. And you just can never really hold on to that. So I choose to bet on the color, not the point. And yeah. my color is blue. And the reason why my color is blue is because the blue party or the Democratic Party has been a party that represented the interest of people uh, uh, of um of the people that look like me and our people that was able to benefit from that interest or, for, or from those politicians or from that party, if you will. So so the reality is um I'm voting for the party that supports the NAACP the party that supports the Black Caucus, the party that supports civil rights and those organizations, immigration, LGBTQ rights, those issues that support minority interest. Um, and, and that's what I want the culture to understand is, I don't care about Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton. I don't care about the individuals because it's hard to hold them accountable. It's too many layers. I'm voting for the party that supports the interest of my people and those organizations that get funding from those parties to put back into my community. So, yeah. so, so that's what I want people. I'm, I'm excited about the level of interest, the level of energy, and the level of conversations coming from the culture. Because y'all, you might agree or disagree, but this the first. Even without Obama, like outside of Obama, like everybody is talking about voting. I'm talking about, you know. I'm looking at Ralph Lauren, you know, as I'm looking at clothes that I'm about to buy, like they got vote t-shirts. You know what I'm saying? Like you can see voting is the NFL, the NBA, everybody's talking about voting in a way they hadn't before. And I just think that that's exciting to just see how much energy is coming into, in, in, into play. And I think it's the amount of money. A lot of people don't understand that money comes into the communities where the people vote the most because the politicians understand that they got to get into those communities to influence the people who are turning out and actually voting. So they spend money on paying people to knock on doors. They spend money on paying people to, you know, support their campaigns. So that's that's how you really pimp the butterfly is if you have power and you exercise that power, money always follows that. So that's another reason why we should vote for the culture. I definitely, I've always been excited about voting, but I do definitely think that we need to, I say we, um, when I say that, I mean the Democratic Party, or not the Democratic Party, I, I mean the African Americans that vote Democrat for, because we, those have been, you know, we've aligned, they're aligned with our views. What can we, what do you think it will take for us to begin to see a change or like representation um, and policies that benefit us. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, I think it's twofold, right? So my particular interest lies with us grooming our own candidates. We got to stop talking about what the white man gonna do for the black community. That's not a thing. You see what I'm saying? Like white men have never, I don't care what part of they come from, went out their way to do things for the black community. The black community always died 
for these things. You see what right. I'm saying? So I think that grooming our own candidates and put money up to get them elected is the number one thing that we could do because at that point, we ain't gotta ask for permission. You see what I'm saying? Cause you gonna control the policy, right? If we don't do that, then I think that if we leave it up to, in quote, the white man, then what we need to do is identify exactly what are our policies? Right. You know, what is our platform? What is our plan? What is our program? And then do a great job at forcing your, not your president, but your state representatives, your senators, people who are in Congress to actually uphold those policies. And that's what I call the political structures. People who are in the pipeline, your district attorneys, your sheriffs, see what I'm saying, your coroners, like people that 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 you can vote for on the county level, yeah. at the local politics. Those are the people that control and actually regulate um, and enforce policies. So we got to do a better job at actually turning out and voting on the county level and the state level as well. If we don't do that, I don't think that we'll get a return on our investment. And that's why I get a little frustrated sometimes when the culture judges um, politicians and uh, politics and the political process um, of past experiences when we really hadn't done a great job at engaging in the political structure simply because we really don't understand it. Yeah. So I think that we got to understand it to be able to influence it to get the return on investment that we desire. Are you excited about Initiative 65? I am. That's why I asked you this question. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, for obvious reasons, right? I mean, but the reality is Mississippi shouldn't always be the last to participate in emerging industry. Yeah. And the other thing is by supporting Initiative 65, you know, you're really looking at reducing the prison population by 50 percent. And Mississippi is an agricultural state. And we haven't been able to come up with, you know, um, with uh, industries uh, as strong as the cotton industry was. I mean, we got catfish popping and some other smaller industries. But I think that the hemp industry um, would be excellent for us African-Americans who our great grandparents and our grandparents left us all these acres of land and we don't really know what to do with them. So I look at it from, I look at it from a social empowerment perspective by reducing the, the number of prisoners, as well as an opportunity for us to engage in some economic power by using what our great grandparents and great grandparents left us, even though we look at them as being poor, but they left us acres. So we can then get into the cultivation um, and the production of hemp products and hopefully put a little bit of uh, uh, bread in our pockets. I definitely feel like it's gonna get passed. Um, and I really feel like eventually, like come to follow that will be recreational. And I think that anybody that's still out there on the streets living that life, they really need to be starting to pivot and prepare themselves to become legit with it. Cause I really feel like it's gonna happen. Um, so, like I said, this is our last episode before the election. If you could say anything to try to really get people out there to go vote, what would it be? And listen, it's an experiment. Like, go vote just because if you don't vote, how can you judge the process? You see what I'm saying? And it ain't just about voting for this president. As soon as the presidential election pass, you start your municipal elections, right? So you got to get out and vote for your mayor and for your board of aldermen, because those are the people that control your day to day. You get a quicker return on your investment with the decisions that they make. Soon as that election is over, you get into your congressional elections, right? Where I think congressional, I ain't no expert, but I think, you know, then you'll go vote for your state representatives and your senators or what have you. And after that, then you got your judicial elections, I think it is, right? And then after that, you know, it's another four years you'll be voting for a president. So there's an election pretty much every year. Every year. And we gotta we gotta commit to doing this for the next 20, 24, 28, 32 years before we can really judge whether or not the process is rigged, whether or not it works for us, or whether or not we have got the outcomes that we desire. So another thing before we go is outside of politics, on the economic side of the conversation, if you really wanna see our communities change, we gotta concentrate the black middle class. That's the move. So if you are African-American, 
you know, making a livable wage. You need to be looking at moving back into the black communities where the property values are cheap, where you can all concentrate your wealth and all your kids could be disciplined, going to school, improving the school districts, improving the property values and building wealth for the black community, just like black communities did before integration. If we're not doing that, then we lying to ourselves about expecting for our communities to change and there ain't no politician that's gonna come in and change it for us. So I just want everybody to get out, vote for the culture and, um, and, and engage in power. Well, I appreciate you uh, sitting, taking the time out to talk to me. Where can people find you? What platforms can they follow you on? Everything is at Jai Keaton. You can Google that, you can Facebook that, you can Instagram that, you can hashtag that, at Jai Keaton, J-H-A-I-K-E-E-T-O-N. And I'm in the city. All my people that's out there, y'all want to catch me. I'm not in Atlanta no more. I'm not in D.C. no more. I'm not in New York no more. I am in Jackson, Mississippi by way of Mars Point. So shout out to my people on the Gulf Coast and holla at me if you're in the Jack. Peace. Thank you. We're going to vote for the culture next Tuesday. <laughs>